Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. John MacArthur. So uh, thank, you. thank you for joining us, John. My pleasure. You can hear me, I hope. Yes, sir, we can hear you wonderfully. They've asked me to begin by introducing you, and <laughs> we all know you and we know of you, but just to state the obvious, uh, Dr. John MacArthur is the pastor-teacher of Grace Community Church in Sun Valley, California. Uh, has been there, what, 47, 48 years? How many, John? Um, well, I came in 1969, so 46 years, heading toward 47 uh, in February. Wow. That's amazing. In one pulpit, uh, Sunday morning, Sunday night, all these years, and God has done a wonderful thing. Uh, that we, he, John has seen a seminary grow up with 400 students there that uh, really within a pebble's toss of his office. Um, the writing ministry of Dr. MacArthur has been so prolific. Uh, I think you have completed now your last commentary on the New Testament, which is the Gospel of Mark. Is that, is that correct? That that is correct. Yeah, that's uh, that's a, a welcome reality. Uh, I think uh, probably 35 years um, in in doing those for 35 years, as you know, um, always with commentary chapters in my hands in one form of uh, editing or finishing or wrapping up or rough drafting, constantly for for 35 years. So when I put that to rest. Uh, it was a huge, huge change in my life. Gave me back some of my life. I'm grateful. Well, uh, it has been a treasure for the church, and it has really given an example of expository preaching uh, to a whole generation uh, of preachers. Uh, I know my four children have attended the Master's College and have graduated from the Master's College. Dr. MacArthur is the president of the Master's College. Um, my twin boys started school there in like Luke 6, and they graduated in like Luke 12. <laughs> so John has always said, uh, slower is better than faster, deeper is better than shallower. So uh, that, that's the case. So... Uh, but we all know of his prolific ministry, and in March, uh, the Shepherds Conference is taking on a new dimension um, as you are holding a summit uh, on biblical inerrancy, uh, which is sold out, and I think approaching 5,000 people have signed up for it, and what's unique about the Shepherds Conference is that it's all men, it's all preachers and missionaries around the world, and so it's a gathering of strong men. And as a point of dis uh, beginning our discussion, John, please tell us how this was born in your heart, um, how this came to the forefront of your mind, and how it is you have been compelled to focus on this subject of biblical inerrancy. Well, I think uh, throughout my ministry, from the beginning to, to the very present day, I've always felt like I had to defend the integrity and authority of Scripture. There, there was always an attack from, from one angle or another, um, always an effort to discredit Scripture, to question Scripture. Uh, this started for me when I was a seminary student and going through seminary. Um, we were battling liberalism. The, the faculty were devoted to educating us as seminary students in those days. To, to fight against those who made an all-out frontal attack on the authority of Scripture, denied its uh, divine character. Uh, and, and through the years, I've just noticed that even after um, ICBI, which was really an incredible effort by a hundred men who were pulled together, uh, folks might not realize this, but there were a hundred men chosen for that. I honestly don't know how I got picked for that, but there were two of us who were pastors out of a hundred, ninety-eight uh, were professors and teachers, and there were two pastors, myself and Jim Boyce. Uh, and I, I was in, I, I felt like I was in way over my head with, with those guys. I, I knew I loved the Word of God. I, I knew I was committed to this. I had the privilege of working on a, on a committee with, uh, with Jim Boyce and um, Roger Nicole and just some other people that I, that I hadn't previously known. 
it was an elevated experience for me. I was absorbed in the whole thing, saw the value of it, um, saw the accomplishment of it, the impact of it, and yet it, it wasn't very long uh, b before the, the Word of God was just under attack from other angles. And it continues to be the case. While you might say that was a massive fortification of the doctrine of inerrancy, um, like the Reformation, it didn't take long for people to work pretty hard to undo the impact of that. And here we are again, and we have an entire generation of people who haven't fought the battle for the authority and inerrancy of Scripture. The, there, there are many men in ministry who couldn't give you a case for biblical authority. They couldn't defend if they were asked why they believe that every word of God is true. Defend that. Defend it, um, defend it internally from the text of Scripture. Defend it externally from the validations of, of fulfilled prophecy and, and, and reason. Um, they, they couldn't give you a defense of that. They, they, I don't know that they could even give you uh, a clear defense of why it is necessary to have an inerrant Scripture in order for the Holy Spirit to do His work of saving and sanctifying. Uh, th those are foundational realities. Um, since um, early in my ministry, and I, I was just talking to one of our guys at the seminary and, and saying, I don't know how the Lord wired me this way, but from the day I showed up for seminary as a kid, I was just wired to the Scripture. I was hardwired to absolute confidence in the Word of God. Um, and this is the foundation of all effective ministry. See, if you and I know, uh, because we teach, we team teach that preaching course, and you know how every year I start that preaching course with a Trinitarian defense of, of biblical exposition. We, we, have to, we have to exposit this word. It is the word of God. It is, it is God's word and God must speak. It is Christ's word and he must speak. It is the, work, uh, it is the word of the Holy Spirit and he must speak. As preachers, we... We have a Trinitarian mandate. The Trinity speaks through the Scripture. Um, so having a view of Scripture that is absolutely, unequivocally clear and accurate, and that the Scripture is absolutely pure, every word of God is pure, is the foundation for all ministry, which is, is really just a delegated responsibility so that the Trinity can communicate and do its great work through human instruments. Our connection to Scripture then is the most essential thing there is. And again, we have a, we have a generation of, of young guys in ministry in particular who have um, kind of been suckered on, and I use that as a pun, uh, on uh, methodology and uh, cultural cues and entertainment and how to attract a crowd who are, are pretty far away from being able to understand uh, and to articulate and defend the, the nature of Scripture the way they should. And while you don't necessarily have people running around denying the authority of Scripture, you have a kind of de facto denial of its authority because it's replaced with so many, many other things. And it's treated with such superficiality, um, pretexts uh, out of verses taken out of context. I, I was at a conference recently, and uh, um, a man spoke, and he spoke on the, the parable of the Good Samaritan. The parable of the Good Samaritan has been around long enough to, to be understood. It's been around long enough. There's plenty of stuff that can tell you exactly how to interpret that. And it was a fast and loose, slam, bang, miss. Con, a misconstruction uh, of that parable, then misapplied, which was not a tacit denial of Scripture's authority, but it was just it was just riding over the top of what Scripture intended to say. It was a low view, in my mind, of Scripture, and I'm concerned that we have a generation who aren't bound by their conscience. I mean, bound strongly by their conscience to handle the Word of God accurately because it is the Word of God. It's, it's almost like a book they feel free to manipulate for their own ends, which comes back to how you really view the Scripture.
uh, for for those kinds of reasons, um, I, I I felt that this generation was getting away with some things that um, they shouldn't be getting away with, and we needed to tie down all the all the loose bolts on on this issue of biblical authority. And inerrancy does that. You can talk about it, authority, and authority is a, is a kind of a general concept. You can talk about inspiration, and that's kind of a general concept. But when you start saying inerrancy, now you're buttoning down the details. Now you're saying, oh, what you mean is there are no errors? If there are no errors, then every word is God's word. That changes what I do. That changes how I approach the book. So, look, that's what the Master Seminary stands for. Um, that's what we've always stood for. Uh, and so do so many, many men that, that I know and love and appreciate and whose ministries we all depend on across the country. So I thought, what if we all get together and raise the flag for inerrancy as a way to lock down at the smallest detail the authority and inspiration of Scripture? So that's a long answer, but you know me. I give long answers. <laughs> we love you for those complete, <laughs> long, deep answers, John. Absolutely. <laughs> Before I ask you this next question, just to let you know as well, uh, Dr. R.C. Sproul sitting about six feet from me right here on the front row and sends his greetings to you as well. And Dr. Sinclair Ferguson is on the front row also listening. Uh, Dr. Stephen Nichols, and uh, you really have some strong supporters here. Well, you could have told me that before I <laughs> ran all that off. Thanks a lot, Steve. <laughs> Next time we play golf, you'll be carrying my bag. RC said he's about 40 yards past you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't doubt it. Over the years, you've seen a lot of attacks on the Scripture, attacks on inerrancy, attacks on sufficiency, attacks on perspicuity, just a full spectrum of different angles and different attacks. Take some time and maybe do a 360 look around uh, the scene and tell us where you have seen or do see these various attacks on different aspects um, of what really affects the inerrancy of Scripture. Yeah, uh, and I think it's it's safe to say that not 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 all these attacks are are questioning the inerrancy of Scripture. Some do. They they don't overtly do that. Liberalism does. The head-on frontal attack denies inspiration, denies divine authorship, and denies inerrancy. Um, the the more subtle attacks. Are, come from people who would affirm the Bible, affirm the Bible's truthfulness, affirm the Bible's uh, inerrancy, I suppose, uh, if, if they're going to use that term. I remember some years ago, just as an illustration, uh, some years ago I, I was invited to Fuller Seminary uh, by the president at the time, who was David Hubbard, and uh, the reason that I was invited was to speak to the board and a group of, uh, of the faculty and uh, this was a meeting that was called by one of the board members because the, the board member said when we come here for a board meeting, uh, we are told that Fuller Seminary upholds the authority, inspiration, and inerrancy of Scripture. But when we leave the board meeting, go back in, into our worlds, all we hear is that they don't. So what is the truth? Do you or do you not believe in inerrancy? We, we want to hear from outsiders. It was an, really a unique meeting. Uh, Ken Concer came, uh, some of you guys will remember him, uh, to sort of represent the theological world. Ian Hay came to represent the world of missions, uh, missionary in Africa. And I came to represent the church at, at the invitation. And the, uniformly, all of these guys were told that the faculty believed in inerrancy and that that, that, are, that had been articulated in a book by a guy named Jack Rogers, the truth was he had just changed the definition of inerrancy, just changed it, called it inerrancy. Well, we had this meeting, uh, and, and it, was a, it was a kind of frightening experience for the powers that be because um, Ian Hay, I remember, said, we wouldn't take a graduate of this seminary 
as a medical missionary. We wouldn't take a graduate of the seminary in our mission under any conditions because of the view of scripture. Um, and then it was my turn to speak, and I've been known to kind of speak my mind on issues like that, and, and I did, and I had some pretty powerful quotes uh, from some people. I, I found some quotes from people at Union Seminary who said, watch out for Fuller Seminary guys. They're masquerading as liberals, but they're really fundamentalists. Uh, that, was, that was Union Seminary's spin on what they were trying to do, and I said, you're like the guy in the Civil War with gray pants and a blue coat. You're going to get shot by both sides. So it, it, it was a graphic a moment in my life to watch an institution try to change the game by changing the definitions. Well, R.C. and I have talked about this through the years. Uh, I remember, remember R.C., you, you, you tried to get me to buy into your new term for justification. You were going to call us all imputationists. And I didn't like that because it sounded like you just had a limb removed. But we're always fighting for those terms. We're always wrestling for those terms. We're always trying to hang on to the definitions that are classic and historic. And, and the enemy keeps changing and shifting those things. So, Stephen, trying to answer your question, um, you know, they tamper with justification. They tamper with inerrancy. They tamper with inspiration. They tamper with all these things. Um, there are those people who don't even overtly tamper. But, for example, we did a conference on strange fire. The entire charismatic movement assaults the singular authority and, and inerrancy of the once for all delivered to the saints' faith by offering a complete different separate genre of, of revelation. And, and that is um, mystical experience, divine visions, revelation. It's, it's kind of a Protestant form of, of, uh, of, of Catholic tradition. So there are those, those, um, those kinds of assaults. Uh, there, there are the assaults of those who think the Bible is um, dated, uh, who, who think the Bible is out of touch with the, the modern times, that the Bible reflects um, primitive insights. And, of course, I've, I've stood toe-to-toe -to -toe in a debate with Troy Perry, the head of the Metropolitan Church, over the homosexual issue, and that's, that's his argument. I believe the Bible. I was raised to believe the Bible. I'm a Christian, but of course the Bible is psychologically unsophisticated, primitive, belonged to an era when there were strange biases, and we've got to update the Bible. There's just absolutely no end to all the assaults on the Scripture. Um, I wrote a book, Sufficiency of Scripture, because at the time Christian psychology was kind of king in the church, and they were riding high, and uh, everything that God wanted to do in your life took psychotherapy before the Holy Spirit could get started. Um, just bizarre approaches to spirituality. Uh, mysticism is, is another one that's always around, still around, um, in Catholic forms that are being imported by many evangelicals um, in the spirituality departments of seminaries and Christian colleges. So it's just endless, and uh, I think there's a susceptibility to falling prey to these kinds of things. Um, I mean, it's obvious. Uh, pragmatism has done massive damage in the church, massive damage. And some of the, the worst damage by pragmatism is done when the pragmatist says he's an expositor, or even when he says he's reformed. All kinds of damage done. So I'm 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 bound by my own heart and and I and I believe by the men such as you men and others who hold so tightly to the singular authority, inerrancy, and inspiration of Scripture to pull us all together and say let's let's say something to this generation and trust that the Lord will use it in in a great way. Amen. Everyone's saying amen here, John. Um, I've heard you talk about the mandate of inerrancy is expository preaching. Uh, and mandate's a strong word, and you intend it to be a strong word. Um, talk to us about the inseparable connection between an inerrant text, a scripture, 
and what the preacher does when he stands before the people of God? Well, you know, that normally takes you and me a, a week to parse that reality, but I, I would say this, Steve. It, it, we summed it up in a little ad for the seminary. Every word inspired, every word preached. Every word inspired, every word preached. Um, the Bible is, is brutalized um, as people ride over the top of it and pluck off what they want. I hear it all the time. Christian television is my entree into all that's aberrant, I, I confess. Um, people use the Bible. The, the, the Bible is, the Bible is uh, uh, how can I say this, divinely reasonable, rational, sensible, linear, chronological. The, the, the arguments uh, of the words and the, and the paragraphs and, and the books are divinely authored. They are, they are supernatural. They're beyond genius. And to just bounce across the top and pluck up stuff and tell stories about it misses what is the profound reasonings of the mind of God delivered in a way that we can grasp and by which we can be transformed. I, I preach uh, verse by verse by verse by verse, word by word by word by word, and I just stand in that pulpit and look out at 3,000 people in twice on Sunday morning and then again another group on Sunday night and I just I just watch them captured by the text I watch them caught in the in the dynamics I I was preaching last night and, and thinking about on, on Acts 7 uh, on Stephen and the, the the power of that sermon is is not in just picking off things but he, here is a guy who has been called before the Sanhedrin that just called for the execution of Jesus Christ. I mean, they've just been through all of that, all those machinations uh, a, a few months before that brought Jesus to the cross. And here is this guy who ha has only been a Christian for a few months at the most, but he really knows the Old Testament. He is an, uh, he's an amazing man because if there were, let's say, I don't know, uh, 15,000, 20,000 believers by then, and they picked seven men who were full of faith, full of the Holy Spirit, full of wisdom, um, full of power. Th this is one of the best seven guys out of thousands in this baby church. And he has to stand up before the same Sanhedrin and defend himself because they've said, you blaspheme God, you blaspheme Moses, you blaspheme the law, and you blaspheme the temple. And there he stands in front of this massive council and synagogue people who have dragged him there and other folks, and he gives this incredible biblical defense. And he goes back to the, all, the, all the segments of Israel's history and gives honor to God, honor to Abraham, honor to the law, honor to the temple, and then flips the whole thing over and says, your forefathers were the blasphemers. They blasphemed God. They blasphemed Moses. They blasphemed the law. And you're guilty even now blaspheming the temple. Um, it, it is one of the great expositions of the Old Testament. And when you look in the book of Acts even before that, those disciples didn't seem to, well, they don't preach any sermons in the book of Acts. They don't preach any sermons. Uh, when they finally began to preach, all they could do was, preach the Old Testament because that was their Bible and from the first chapter on all of a sudden they understand the Old Testament because it's post Emmaus Road it's post resurrection night in the upper room and Jesus has taught them how to understand the Old Testament and all the things in it about him and they all of a sudden become expert Old Testament preachers they are the first generation of preachers and they just relentlessly depend upon the Old Testament um, so as you unfold that, I've been going through the book of Acts, and you just watch people caught up in the dramatics of, of the carefully crafted, inspired revelation of God. It's amazing, and it's life-transforming. So I, I know I'm being a little anecdotal in answering your question. But look, I'm, I'm at the, this is the view from the hearse, okay? I mean, I'm at the end of the road here. 
So I'm, I'm looking back and telling you, this is what it looks like from the hearse after 45 years plus of opening the Word of God to people. Um, the, I, I've seen the impact of it. And I, 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 look, I don't have any other option. This is a book. This is not a lot of scattered spiritual ideas. This is not, um, this is not some some kind of a grab bag where you come up with an idea and try to find a verse that kind of anchors your idea. This is, God wrote a book. He didn't do a music video. He wrote a book. And the book is, is logical and linear and it's, its profundities and its riches and its treasures are found by those who most carefully walk through word by word. That's how you unpack the richness of this book. So that's, that's where the mandate is. If I have in my hand uh, uh, the, the very Word of God, and if I am called to preach the Word of God, then where's the confusion about what I need to do? doesn't mean I can't preach a, a theological message. I must preach a theological message. I preach the text, and then I preach what the text reveals. The, the principles that come out of the text, the doctrines that come out of the text, I preach them, I expand them, I follow them biblically from beginning to end, I systematize them. But they are, no man can be a faithful theologian who hasn't been a faithful exegete and expositor. Uh, the mandate is, again, tied to the intensity with which you view the Scripture. And again, I go back to what I said earlier. Look, who has a right to speak to his church? God does. He purchased the church with His own blood. Who has a right to speak to His church? Christ does. He is the head of the church. And how does the head of the church mediate His authority in the church? Through His Word. How does the Holy Spirit do His work? We are begotten again by the Word of truth, and we're sanctified by Thy Word, Jesus said. And the Word is the agent, the tool that the Holy Spirit uses. The Trinity, the Trinity speaks to the church does the work of redemption in the church through the Word. Ministry, being a pastor, is nothing more than being the human instrument that God uses to bring that Word to His people. Amen. I wish you could hear all the people saying amen, John, as you uh, are unfolding that answer. There's a lot answer. of Baptists in the room. Yeah. <laughs> I wish I were there, Steve. I, I confess. I'd, I'd love to see all of you. Thanks for an invitation. <laughs> I thought of several funny things to say, but I won't say it right now. So. <laughs> all right, you, you know talked to us about inerrancy and the pulpit. Talk a moment about inerrancy in the pew as far as living my Christian life, finding my place of ministry, carrying out the work of evangelism. Why, why is inerrancy important for the layperson in the pew? Uh, you like to use the word gravitas um, because <clears throat> you need something weighty to motivate your life. You, you need something transcendent to motivate your life. Um, you've got to get beyond your own ambition uh, your own desire for success, you, your own um, uh, hopes, you, you, you've got to have something more than that. You, you've got to get beyond somebody's uh, uh, emotional stimulation or emotional motivation. If, if you're going to do this for a lifetime, if you're going to live this book, if you're going to honor God, if you're going to walk with Christ, if you're going to live in the power of the Holy Spirit, if you're going to have an impact in the world, there has to be such a weight imposed upon your otherwise disobedient flesh that you can't shake the weight of that. A superficial sermons don't do that. Uh, going and hearing some novel treatment that tickles your fancy and gives you interest and, and maybe touches your emotions and maybe motivates you to do something right for a few hours. A very short fix. Uh, I, I've always said my responsibility as a pastor is to give the congregation the lifelong gift of the weightiness of Scripture. 
so that they feel the weight of Scripture constantly on them, that they can't escape it. Um, and the scripture is its own greatest defense. One of the side benefits, well, maybe one of the best benefits of Bible exposition is they, they see its truthfulness at the deepest level. Under the most careful scrutiny, under the most intense comparison, you know where you're comparing scripture with scripture and you're explaining this one by that one and you see there's no inconsistency and when you, when you penetrate into scripture at the deepest, deepest level, its integrity, its truthfulness stands and holds. And when you have done that with people, there's an inescapable reality that this is a divine book. And so you're, you're, the people are accumulating a confidence in the weightiness of Scripture. It is the Word of God. It is binding. Um, I, I don't think you can say that and and uh, expect that they're going to necessarily buy into it. I think you have to prove that, and week in and week out, time after time, as you expound for them the depth of Scripture, and it stands every test of reason, every test of history, every test of comparison with itself. Um, people say, this is true, this is true, this is true. And the more they trust the word the more they obey the word but even beyond that the more they know that this is God who has placed this responsibility on them and there are blessings for obedience and there will be consequences for disobedience the stronger the weight of scripture becomes upon their souls and I've always wanted the people of our church to be joyful and they are, and our church, you know, is a happy, joyful place because it, the weight of Scripture is also the weight of blessing as well as the weight of healthy fear. So uh, when people feel the weight of Scripture, both for its blessing and its disciplines, um, it acts as the greatest force in their lives. And then you're not telling him every week, you know, let me give you ten things to do, or let me give you five practical applications. I always talk about implication more than I talk about application, because I don't know every application. But, but I know that Scripture has implications. It has profound implications, divine implications. Your soul is before God here on this issue and every issue in Scripture. And there are implications for or disobedience, and there are implications for obedience at every point which Scripture speaks. And those are the implications that I want to lay as a heavy weight on people. And when they walk in obedience, the, the joy and blessing is exhilarating, and I think we see that. Amen. Uh, this fall, yeah, go ahead and clap. They don't clap here at St. Andrews, but you're getting applause, John, so uh, that's good. Well, I, I really do wish I were there. I would, I would love the fellowship. Well, we wish you were here, and it would elevate already more a summit experience here. Um, we have five minutes. Um, this fall, Dr. Sproul and Dr. Nichols and myself were able to go on a church history tour of New England, hmm. and view the Edwards and Whitfield sites, and we went to Princeton, and we went into Miller Chapel, and we had our own service, and we were able to preach on the inerrancy of the Word of God. Um, Dr. Sproul said, I wonder when the last time there was a sermon on the inerrancy of Scripture was preached in Miller Chapel, and we were reminded that that was where Benjamin Breckenridge Warfield's funeral was, and when they carried his casket out, J. Gretchen Machen said, there goes old Princeton. I know Warfield has had an effect on your thinking as a younger man in the ministry, as you read, I think, what, the inspiration and authority of Scripture, yeah. Yeah. maybe as a way to wrap this up. 
um, maybe just reflect upon your reading of Warfield. You talked about gravitas and the weightiness of that theological mind upon this issue and how it affected you and how it, how it should affect us. Just a very brief statement. Um, I'd, never read, I'd never read anybody reformed growing up. I was wandering around trying to figure spirituality out. I read people like E.M. Bounds. I read Thomas, Thomas A. Kempis. I was trying to get out of my sort of commonplace Baptist zone, and I really didn't know who to read. Um, it was kind of a revivalist, D.L. Moody type uh, environment. I, I, didn't, I didn't read anything. Um, through college, I was exposed to Arminianism because the, the theology, the historic theology of the college I played football for was 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 Arminian, and I read Miley and Wiley, and none of it helped me at all. I I, I didn't I, I I put those books aside, and I've never looked at them since. But when I came to seminary, I I just I hungered to know uh, something deeper than I'd ever known, and so uh, in the first course that we took, um, one of the first courses, I was given reading assignment in B.B. Warfield, Authority and Inspiration of Scripture, and and my whole world opened up. That that was the dawning for me, um, and I just and it was so perfect because that's where everything has to begin. It has to begin there. And he was so erudite, and he was he he was such a scholar that I you know I had been used to dealing with people who weren't, but it it was remarkable. I even went on to read Counterfeit Miracles as well uh, in those early years, and that was my first test. And then. Um, I thought, well, where does he? I saw that he quoted Puritans, and I wanted to find some. So I was talking to a guy. I was speaking at an event. He's a very young guy, and this was a this was a guy who turned out to be a no lordship preacher, an anti lordship preacher. He said, "Well, if you're interested in that stuff, let me let me suggest a book that you probably ought to read," kind of dismissively. And he he gave me the existence and attributes of God by Stephen Charnock. I think he just wanted to get it out of his library. Well, I mean, you know, for the next 30 years of my life, I'm chewing on that thing. Um, and that, that just opened up a world of insight, thought, thinking, theology. I found a copy of Body of Divinity by Thomas Watson. I read Thomas Watson on the Beatitudes. All of that was drawn out of my original experience with Warfield and I was I was in seminary but I was I was kind of in a parallel universe my seminary was committed to the to those things to, to some degree there's no question but it was a Dallas oriented Dallas seminary kind of dispensationally oriented school and I'm grateful for all that I learned there but I was I was cultivating this kind of parallel reading and just being grown up to understand some of those things that I'd never been exposed to. So, um, yeah, that got me going, and, you know, once you find the good stuff, uh, the, the rest kind of fades off the list. Amen. Well, John, thank you so much for joining with us. I wish you could see it. It's a packed house here, just <laughs> totally packed, and uh, your participation in this is a huge part of this, and we thank the Lord for your desire to have this summit in March, and many of us in this room, I've spoken with many here, will be there in Los Angeles to be a part of this uh, very unique gathering, and so we offer thanks to the Lord for how he's worked through you to affect all of our lives. So, Well, l listen, it's, it's my wonderful joy and privilege, and uh, I'm just thankful to be here and being able to do this. And I'm going to keep doing this if RC will keep going along with me. <laughs>